The Mets played last on Wednesday. It seems like 100 years ago now because in the playoffs to have – what Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three days. It feels like a week. <laughs> it's it's great for them, and I think and I think it's you know if you're a Met fan, you have to be loving the chance that your your older pitchers get a chance to rest here, your bullpen just gets a chance to rest here. As you go into an NLCS, I don't think anybody expected to find you in at the beginning of the season, which I think you can't say for two of the other teams that are in there, given in the Yankees and the Dodgers. That I think. Their presence in their respective league championship series is to, you know, in some ways to be expected, at least by both their own fans and just general fans of baseball. Before we look forward, though, let's look back a little bit on the uh, um, ALDS and the NLDS uh, and what happened. And you had the uh, Tigers uh, that were the little team that could, obviously, and that were the sixth seed, if you will, with, with, with what they do about that. Um, and it looked, you know, bad from the start for the Tigers when they gave up uh, the three-run home run to Lane Thomas in the first game. And that was a Saturday game. Uh, I was out of town. Um, and it's interesting how the very next Saturday, Lane Thomas again hit the final blow of that hit the series. the final blow of that series. And, th and that was a series in which it felt like when the Tigers when the Tigers didn't get – we know they got it to game five. They have Tarek Sco right. Scoobal going. Isn't this what you, you – that's what you hoped for. But when they didn't score – when they had – I think it was in the third inning, they got like – First and second yep. or second and third with no not two outs. And I was thinking they got to get one here when they weren't able to push one across there. And we're kind of like Scoobal has to be in the dugout being like, guys, just get me one. If you just get me one, I can win this. And game. he did say that. I think it, right. they were talking about that. And, and, and it, they got him one. They, but it just, it, it just you know, they needed more than one. They needed more than one. <laughs> and, and the Guardians were able to keep it close. And then Lane Thomas, who had a chance earlier in that game to have a big hit. And, and I think when he came up, you and I were watching the game and we were talking about how it's not good to feel like, you know, oh, man, here comes Lane Thomas. We really need him to deliver here in the playoffs for us. And then, boy, did he deliver. Well, we Met fans know about Lane Thomas because I, I don't know how you felt about him. When he got moved from the Nationals um, over to the uh, Guardians at the trading deadline uh, in July, uh, I thought, you know, that's a good player. And, and, of course, when you see a guy beat your team, you always think he's better than he is, which he's not uh, – he wasn't as good as I thought he was, but he sure came through for the Guardians when they needed him. Right, and looking ahead, he'll definitely be one one of the guys we're talking about when we're previewing the Yankees and the Guardians, but we do have to talk about the other half of that. Well, well I want to just finish on, on oh, Scooble. Okay. So it's going it's going along very well for Scooble, um, and he gets into a little trouble um, and, and in the fifth inning, I think it was, and he gave up uh, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of, uh, I think, a walk and a, and a and hit. hit by pitch. And, and, then, and so the bases are loaded, and Ramirez comes up, and, and – Inexplicably, I guess, because the last thing I expected at that point, it's it's a nothing, nothing. It's a one nothing game for for uh, Detroit for Detroit, and so this is it. He's going to get him out here. Mm -hmm. you know, this is the best one of the best hitters in the American League. Scoob's going to take him out, and he hits him with the first pitch. Right, and, <laughs> and then they left him in after that. And so the, he's he's disturbed, obviously, because right, he just hit the, a guy to tie the game that up, was the and thing, he gave it the one run that he had. That was the <laughs> thing that didn't make sense to me, is that after he hits Ramirez, they leave him in the game. Well, no, no, the, the, the pitching coach goes out there to talk to him, and so what he, I'm sure he didn't say is, throw one right down the middle, and he'll hit it over the fence, it'll be fun. Right, but I'm saying, I'm the saying one, as the manager, which is what he did. that's where you have to protect your player. He's a young kid. He was clearly rattled from hitting Ramirez. And you know he's thinking, okay, I just got to get a strike here. Just don't do that again. And he grooves one and he hits it over the fence. And he had been pitching unbelievably well in that series up until right that the moment. The whole season, the guy's the Cy Young winner. I think 17 or something postseason innings in a row without a run. And then yeah. it all falls apart in, in two a, In just the most bizarre fashion. And, and, and surely whatever the pitching coach said to him, he should never say to any pitcher ever again. I, I, think, it's, <laughs> I, th I think you're laying a lot of blame on the pitching coach. I'm, I'm kidding. I, I, I think you said it yourself. He didn't tell him, hey, lay one over the <laughs> exactly. middle and have Thomas hit it over the fence. Exactly. But I guess um, when you think about it, you know, the Tigers, and we, we, we said this all along the way, the Tigers, it would have been there, you know, everything it was good. No matter what happened, it would have been fine had they even lost in the, in the, in the prior round. Mm -hmm. You know, because they had an amazing comeback an amazing you know season and in the future of that that franchise is very bright uh I, you I, I you have say. to hope that this isn't a flash in the pan kind of thing that this isn't a marlins type season where you had an it's not it's well you have to hope you because you can't you can't say for sure you have to they have to come out and continue to play i think the fact that they have a guy like scuba at the top of their rotation makes that a lot more likely they have riley olsen who's another good young pitcher so they have the guys to keep this up but that's just something you do have to consider but then as i said going over to the other side of the ALDS with the Yankees and the Royals 
after game one got away from the Royals, it sort of felt like that series was probably not going to go their way. It was just like, oh, I felt like if they were going to win that series, they really they couldn't let a game like that get away from them. I think that's that's a really good point. And in those shorter series, and and and, and obviously the wild cards are best of three, uh, and and the division series best of five. Winning that first game is of paramount importance, much more than it is in a seven-game series. Right. In a seven-game series, you can lose game one, and it might not have a big overall impact on the outcome of the series. It may. It could be a big game one loss, but it's only one game out of the four that you need to win. But when you win and lose game one in a best of three or a best of five, it really puts you in a difficult spot. And and we saw that, you know, you just you're behind the eight ball just from the game one. When the Phillies lost game one to the Mets with Zach Wheeler pitching, they were kind of like, oh, this isn't good. Like Because now now it gets hard. And even though they came back to win game two in a kind of magical fashion, you're still thinking, OK, we're one one going back to their place. And if we lose game three. We're now facing an elimination game in their stadium, and that gets spooky really quick. And, and you know, the Yankees had game two in, in, in pretty well in hand, and then they lost that game, as, as you mentioned. And it was Jazz Chisholm's comments, and he's the newest Yankee, I guess, mm -hmm. um, who I think he was trolling uh, the Royals when he goes, they got lucky. Right. Like, like, what is that? They got lucky. You know, of course, it's he's, he's just trying to generate a response. And, and, and some people thought, oh, that's bulletin board material, you know, for the Royals. And I think the Royals go, go, oh, he was just being jazz. He's just goofy. And, you know, they'll say anything. It didn't mean anything. That's that's amusing. I, 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 I think <laughs> in the moment it pisses off the other team. But like long term, there's not going to be bad blood because of those comments. Not that I think. I mean, maybe you never know what baseball players will choose to hold on to for motivation. And, and the, uh, you know, the Yankees. Yankees didn't get very much out of Aaron Judge and Juan Soto in that series. So just but just like we'll talk about with the Dodgers, you know, they got enough from the other right. guys, and that's and that's going to be a running theme you're going to see with three of the four postseason teams is that they all have at least one or two superstars in their lineup. But the real question about their offense is who else on the team is going to step up because if they don't, like we're going to talk about, well, they have a lot of trouble on offense then. Right, right, and and you know we talk about this all the time. If, if we looked at pitching to the Yankees, uh, for example, I would you know I would say let okay. How about we never throw Judge or Soto a pitch the entire series? Well, let's try that. And that was sort of the strategy. It felt like the Padres were employing against the Dodgers in their series, where they're like, we're just not going to really pitch to Otani and Betts, and we're going to just try and limit the damage they do. I just think the thing that they didn't count on was their own offense going absolutely ice cold. You know, and, and uh, you know, the Yankees, you know, bat Austin Wells, the rookie catcher, uh, number four in the lineup. And I had to take a step back for a second going, I don't think we talk enough about, you know, the this player. The rise. Right, this player. And, you know, as, as Met fans, we, we love Francisco Alvarez. We think he's still on the come and, and going to get better and better. He never batted clean up for the Mets. No. He, he, you know, so I think Austin Wells, you know, deserves like he, to, to hold down that spot in the New York Yankee lineup. When they really needed it and, and, and kind of the the you to just look on the other side of that matchup because we do need to say a piece about the royals here it was a like much like the tigers it was a great season for them you had a lot of progress from your young hitters bobby witt jr proved himself as a superstar in this league i think you know your only fear is you got unbelievable seasons out of guys like lugo and waka and Will you get that quality of season from them again next year? Because all of the other young pieces are there. You really want one other young. You love Cole Reagans as right. one of your pitchers. You know, Brady you know, Singer. You need you know Pasquantino to stay healthy. You need uh, yeah, that hurt them a lot. Right, his his but injury. You, you need one other guy. They were flimsy hitting anyway, right. and so when Pasquantino got hurt, it was like, okay, Bobby Witt, just take everybody on your back and just carry us. Right, all the and way. so I feel like if one other young player can develop offensively for them and give them three guys in that lineup, but you know, because Salvador. Or Perez as great as he is. Yeah, I, I would not want to count on another year want like yeah, this year from him. Count, like, right, you want him to now just be a nice guy in your lineup, not a feature point. Of I it. know he's not 47 years old, but it sure feels like but it it's getting there. Here. So, uh, yeah, I think I think they have a lot to be happy about. And as it turns out, uh, in the National League, the, the pitch to you know, as the Royals were, I think is what the Dodgers showed the Padres by the Padres not scoring a run in the last 24 innings. I don't know why the, Machado. NLDS. Yeah, Machado should have just called another meeting in the dugout. <laughs>
24 innings in a row in a playoff series. I mean, that's going down meekly. Right, that's going down without scoring a run in the last two games of the series. That's brutal. Two and a half games, even. Right, that's brutal when you think about it, though. They had that offensive outburst in game three. They win game three. They're on top. They got of those runs like at the first or second right. inning. They were on top of the world. And then... The God. Padres fans, you know, my friend Tom's like the Padres. They were feeling good, man. Like, oh, we'll they, see you in Mets in the. You know, they were in, on in, top in, of in, the in world. The NLCS. Uh, and and I think we under uh, value the Dodgers sometimes because we like to say, well, it's only Shohei and and uh, Mookie and Freddie Freeman, and then a bunch of guys named Joe. No, actually, there's Teoscar Hernandez, who I just don't give the credit to him that I should. I'm going to do that right now because this guy has been doing it consistently now for, for a while, two seasons, and and this season he had with the Dodgers was no fluke. Uh, you know, his winning the, the uh, home run derby wasn't a fluke. And this guy's a tough hitter in big situations, and he's the other bat in that lineup that you really fear, besides and, Will Smith. And, and, I think the, and I think the other thing that you would say is in a, in a postseason of a lot of rookie managers, Dave Roberts has proved his value as a great manager because he did a fantastic job in that series managing, especially with the way he used his bullpen against the Padres. It seemed like every button he pushed over those last two games was exactly the right button to push because that is a team that doesn't have a ton of starters, and they found a way to kind of work their way through it. All the teams, and, and when we preview, it was like all they start. Actually, it's only the Mets, really, whose starting pitching has held up of the four teams. The left. Yankees, kind of. Not really, because you lost Cortez. He's out. He's right. injured. And so you're, you're not sure who you're going to pitch in. Well, we'll get to it in, in game one because Cole can't pitch until game two. Right. You that's so really the if problem. If you could pitch that guy every time, you, you would, you would at, the, at this point. So, yeah, I think it was, uh, you know, uh, the Frank, uh, Frank, uh, Roberts, I think, used eight pitchers to get no that was the the guardians who used eight pitchers in nine innings in the final game against detroit and so what it made me think is you know this is the future of of major league baseball clearly the way it's going particularly because of the pitcher injuries and as a fan so we don't get to have the starting pitcher go deep into the game. So it's just different than the way it used to be. You don't have that. So there's no star pitcher but who's there are, carrying through. Except there was because you had – okay, if Scooble, if the Tigers win that game and Scooble well, we goes got eight him. innings, we're talking about how we have that star pitcher. The Mets have gotten fantastic starting pitching from all of their guys. Garrett Cole just came off of a do dominant outing. In Kansas but that's City. only one guy on each of the staffs, and what I'm saying is it's only the Mets who have a, a few guys that can do that. And so it seems like the, the, the future of baseball, particularly in high-leverage games, depending on your pitching, is going to be yeah, having a parade of pitchers. And so when you go and you think about the game that you won, you're going to think about the hitting and the comebacks and all that kind of stuff, but it's not going to be, wow, that pitcher you know stifled them for six or seven innings because it's just not happening. No, but you're going to remember the big outs that each pitcher is going to get. You're just not going to – what you're not going to do is you're not going to have the romantic story about the starter and how he pr got through right. the game. And that, all I'm saying is, is that's just very different from the way baseball has but, been. But but you're talking the thing is is that I think the issue I'm taking with it is that like you're talking about it as if it's going away. It's just not present every game now. It, and not even close, you know, right. is what it is because there's going to be multiple bullpen games I think, you know, in in these uh championship series for both uh, for both of them. Well, that part of that is because you have a team in the Dodgers where their entire starting rotation has ended up injured. You didn't see that in the Met and Philly series. That was starters going against starters pretty much the whole way. Which is what makes the Met Dodger series a real contrast. Right. You know, and and but the Guardians and the Yankees are kind of similar in that, you know, they have a few Matthew tough Boyd started for you and pitched pretty well, I think, in, uh, against uh, Scooble. And and after uh, two innings, they took him out. Right. He had five strikeouts. Like, what's he doing wrong? Well, he doesn't want to face the the lineup a second time and going so off and and obviously it worked right right you can't, you can't criticize <laughs> can't it Chris, Stephen Vogt you know who's a rookie manager just like Carlos Mendoza of the Mets um, pulled all the right strings in that game and and really got them through in a, in a way that maybe scratched my head when they took Boyd out how are they going to do this they did it right right I think that's the thing these teams are built in this fashion and I, I think the other thing that you were probably not talking about is that the average bullpen guy has gotten better too so oh, definitely a, right. So if you're, when you're bringing a random guy in from your bullpen, it's not like it was back when starters pitched eight innings every game, and that guy was always decidedly worse than the starting pitcher. Relievers are no longer just failed starters. We we saw how in the San Diego Los Angeles uh, series, uh, Tatis, who was one of their best players and great, who did not do very much of anything in the series. Well, after, yeah, after the first couple, after games. the first couple of games, basically faced uh, not seven different pitchers. 
you know, uh, in, in his nine at bats or something like that. So that's going to make it really <laughs> hard. <laughs> wow. You know, you, you, it's just like you never I never saw the guy twice. So and that's what all these teams are trying to do. Right. Is to avoid having the guy have a second look so they can sort of measure him to a degree. It used to be the third time through. Now they're even stopping guys from getting through well, the second that's time. That's what's happening in the playoffs when you're always managing for today and you're not worried about going over the course of a season. You'll use your bullpen in crazy ways that you wouldn't when you have to play two more weeks of consecutive games. Right, right. I wanted to mention one thing. Uh, you know, We're not doing a This Week in Baseball, because, as we talked about off air, because not much is going on, obviously, other than we should be limiting this to the playoffs in the, you know, yeah. right now at this point. Um, Terry Francona, who was hired by the Reds, and I think we mentioned that in our last podcast, said something interesting this week when he was on the um, leadoff spot uh, on Sirius, and he says, you know, the playoffs should have longer series with fewer days off forcing the teams to use fourth and fifth starters, making that more representative of what actually happens in the regular season. He feels the better team would win more often. And, and I started thinking about that going, wow. So his, his idea was to take away even the off days. So maybe you don't have travel days, you know, as much. So you don't have the ability to bring guys back in the same way. And you have to use your pitchers, like, like that fourth starter who will never see the light of day in a, in a playoff series. And that would be a very interesting way of having the team that has more depth be more effective. Right, but does that necessarily lead to an overall better quality I don't of baseball? Know. Like, like, am I, I going to really be happy that I'm I like, okay, know. yeah, I want to hinge this series on which team has the better terrible starter. But over 162 games, that's how you do it. So it is interesting. Now, of course, if all your pitchers are injured anyway, that will even make it more difficult. But the point is for the teams, and of course, this would really favor this year the Mets because well, they go pretty deeper in the, in the I, starting I, I, rotation. I just, I just don't like that because the, it's the implication. Really? Well, I just don't like the idea that, that somehow, that oh, okay, the, the unworthy teams are winning the shorter series. Well, I think there is – certainly you would agree, though, that the chances of an of a underdog winning a shorter series is better than it is winning a longer series. I think that's 100 percent true, and I think that's why most – I would be okay with having that wild card round move to a five-game series instead of a three-game series. That's a whole other discussion that's because we've got to find discussion. air. There ain't right. no much air in the schedule right. in a World Series well, that doesn't start could, to the October could, 25th. You could cut down on the regular season a little bit. Yeah. We need 162 I've said games. That. I said 154. You go back to 154, and there'll be more – playoff revenue i think everybody would make more money in the long right. run and it would make players the, would get sl- injured by a little less maybe because you're it playing would make the first games. round of the playoffs feel a lot more in, like impactful because it isn't three game series where sometimes they just sort of feel rudimentary and sort of just playing them out they don't feel like a real series it wasn't that long ago that the wild card series was a game well just one game right one game so you go and you play you make the playoffs and and if you're the Mets and you remember Madison Bumgarner he right. sent you packing and your season was over and it was done right so so that is a change I just think that like are we necessarily getting better baseball it's like are we going to be and then we also have to think about the other the flip side of that are we really going to enjoy watching some dominant team whip up on a team 5-0 instead of 4-0 more like, okay, the, the the juggernaut Phillies, let's say, they're playing a really weak wild card one year. And now it's like, oh, well, they're already up 4 nothing, and now the wild card's out of starting pitchers, so they're going to throw a tired bullpen game against the Philly lineup. And now the Phillies win 8, 12 That's going to happen. And, and was that better baseball? Oh, but now we're really sure the Phillies are the better team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. To, to me, the thing with the, the whole the better team win just really sounds like salty fans, which is obviously not Frank Kona in this case, but it just feels like what fans say when they're mad that their team lost the series. I, I think it's just a, a, a response to uh, we, we understand that the regular season is a little more devalued than ever before because of the tournament nature of what the playoffs are with the six teams getting in in each league. I think it's exciting. I think these playoffs have been as as right. good as any year. I look at it this way. Does, it, does the regular season matter less? No, because you still need to punch your ticket to the dance. And so the regular season is your chance to get into the tournament and then show you're one of the best teams in the league. The other idea is to have uh, – you, you could start the wild card series with the uh, lower-seeded team down one nothing. And so make them have to, you know, you already have a game. In the, now I think that's crazy to, that's crazy to card a game. But that is that that was some stuff that's been floated out there is to sort of give, again, that premium on being the higher seeded team. Um, I, I want to before we do the previews. Go ahead. It just feels like a lot of work when we had three of the four higher seeded teams win in the divisional round. Anyway, I think that's a really good point. With the Mets are the only wild card team right, left. Right. So uh, why are we trying so hard to talk about how unfair this is when only one team managed to actually 
actually pull off an upset. Not only is is that the case, but the three teams, the Dodgers, uh, Yankees, and Guardians, had the three best records in all of baseball this oh, year, so it looked, along with the Phillies. Right. Only the Mets pulled off an upset, and now we're all going to talk about how broken a system it is. So um, I, I did uh, write something this week and, and notice something as you're watching these things, and that is um, it was good to see Class A get the save uh, and, and his first six-out save uh, to close out the Tigers yesterday. Uh, but, you know, closers, I think, are more vulnerable than than ever, and you have less confidence in their ability to to put the game away than I think you've had in, since closers really became de rigueur back, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Right, much like you were saying, Mariano Rivera is an outlier that we cannot compare guys to. And but I everybody th- does. But everybody <laughs> does. But that's, I think, why you have to look at these bullpens as going, okay, who, and this is what I'm afraid of for the Mets. They probably have the weakest bullpen out of all the teams remaining, bar maybe the Yankees. I think it's probably a toss-up between them and who you want to say is better. Yeah, I'd say the Yankees are better. <laughs> right, right. But you're, you're arguing of who's the better for who's better for third place in that, that that little debate but I think that's what you're worried about with the Mets is like okay you're going to need to get a lot of outs from your bullpen in this series and if the Mets can't make games where they're up by more than a couple runs that's what they were able to do against the Phillies they were able to get some games where they were up five six runs going into because the, the bullpen's going to give some back right they're going <laughs> to give some back that's what you're really afraid of so you know if we have to get a you know, if we have to get three innings of, you know, two, three run out baseball every single game, this is going to be a nightmare series. Well, I, and just watching the Mets close, try to close out the Phillies and, and, and Diaz comes in and it's the ninth inning, you know, and he, and he walks the first two guys, you know, and it's just like, oh, no, you're not going to do this, are right. you? And, and then, it was excruciating right, because watching you already that. Know, he's like, oh, great. He now has to pitch to Schwarber. <laughs> yes. With the, the, as the tying as run. The tying run. And you're like, oh, I know how this ends. I right? know the how this ends. The ball's going over the fence. The it's bo- going to be a tie game. It's going to be a tie he struck him out on a 101 mile on a fastball. So that felt pretty good. <laughs> so, but, you know, it, it, and it, not that that isn't great that it's exciting, but there was a time where the closer would be in there and it was like game over. Like, you know, the Eckersley's, you know, right, home but, run to, but, to, but to that's because you Gibson only rem- was a long time ago. Right, but that's because you only remember Eckersley. We only remember all of the amazing the, closers. Because guess what, Met fans? If you're worried about Edwin Diaz, I don't think you were feeling any more relieved with, let's, let's go down this list. Jury's familiar. Armando Benitez, John Franco. Oh yes, you were, those weren't the cardiac kids at all. <laughs> yeah, right. And and that, that's just it. They haven't really had that, you know, until Diaz, who's you know, got who's just right. He was that way anyway. I, Mariano is the only closer for a year. Any closer can have an aura of invincibility where they're just unhittable. Mariano is the exception where it was sustained over basically an entire career. He ruined it for everybody. Right. In fact, since Mariano did what he did, I, I'm going to pro- no closer will ever get in the Hall of Fame if we try to compare him to Mariano because Kimbrel and and Jansen who are have over 400 saves each, you know, are a lot of people don't think well they're not Hall of Famers. Well, then who's going to be a Hall of right, Famer as gonna, a closer? Nobody's going to be in that because if you look at the teams that are left, really only Classe is the a true because Diaz isn't being used like a closer and he's not having the success of a traditional well, and that's what's changed closer. is like your closer doesn't end the game like it used to when Billy Wagner was out there or or, or Rivero and they, they really didn't ever pitch other than the last inning or inning and a third well, or so and I think that's in part because if you look at these teams that are now in the LCSs in the league championship series three of the four of them have these really I want to say slanted lineups where there is an insane concentration of high leverage outs to get and so you, if you're a team in these LCS situations, you might be in the seventh inning and go, oh, hey, you know what? We got one out and Soto and Judge coming up. Right. I'm going to bring my closer in here because if I clear them and clear this, we might have the game right there. And they might not exactly. ever come up again. And if these are the two most important outs, it's not because if they come up in the ninth inning and the ninth inning is their seven, eight and nine hitter. Did you really do your team a service by waiting to use your closer until then? It's like, yeah, you're probably going to get those guys out anyway. I'm telling you, if it happens to the Mets that way and it's Reed Garrett coming up in the ninth inning, I'm going to be very nervous. <laughs> if, forget the seventh, eighth, and <laughs> yeah, ninth, guys. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, it'll be standing. Inning, yeah. Hopefully, it'll be standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, not going to feel comfortable with that. So the um, the championship series, and I, I, I noticed that this morning, uh, It's not. it doesn't seem like it's always the same. It's 2-3-2. Two, two. So you have two games um, at in, in L.A. if you're the Mets and two games in New York if you're the Guardians, three games at your home field, mm-hmm. uh, and then you come back for the final two games. So it's not the two two one 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 thing, like flying over the country, right, like which they do is, in basketball, they right. do that. But I think it's way better for it to be this way. But it does place a lot, a little bit of pressure on the home team, where you're fine with the split. 
but you got to get a split. I think if you're the away team, like, you know, you're thinking a split would be fine. A split's fine. <laughs> I'll right, go back 1-1. One, one. But I don't think it's as big as a split in, like, a 2-2-1-5 game series. Because 2-2-1-5 two, two, game series, if you get a split in those first two games, you're like, oh, man, if we win game three, we get an elimination game at home. Even if you win those two games on the road as the away team, you still need to win two more games at home to just get out of that. So there's a lot more time for that other team to recover and start playing better. And so as getting a split for the same reason it isn't as big because it's like, okay, you're 1-1. Well, you, only, you have to win the next three games in a row to finish the series in your home ballpark, and that's really hard to do. Not a lot of teams do that. So you're almost thinking right there right. if you split – we're going to be coming back here. So, And, and the history between the, the teams in the playoffs and the Yankees and the then Indians, uh, they say, played in the playoffs, uh, I think, a couple of times back. But I don't think there's any epic Yankee-Cleveland playoff series that's like, oh, looking back to try to make good on that. Um, so, and, and I Wasn't think the Lindor home run against the Yankees? Uh, in in, uh, in 2015 in, in 2016 yeah yeah I think it was you're yeah. right you're right you're right so there, there, there's but I don't I don't think it carries over there's not that history there and and trying to make up a narrative like you know the, between Cleveland and the Yankees or there even is, the Dodgers and the Mets there is the same narrative that exists for every team in the American League that isn't in the AL East and the Yankees they are the Yankees they are the evil empire and we would like to beat them and so they are the juggernaut and this is a Cleveland Guardian team that, if you know, they're looking at getting the, getting a very, very long World Series drought off of their back. And so going through the Yankees is a trial that you kind of have to feel like you have to go through uh, to get your World Series title in a way. This is a fight you have to take. And the poor Yankees haven't won a World Series since 2009, which, you know, we, when you think about it, the Dodgers won in the in the COVID year. So really, if you took about the last time the Dodgers won a World Series that was other than COVID, you got to go back to 1988. Where they beat the Mets in the championship series to, to go on to win, win the World, World Series. Series. So, so, you know, I, I think that you know, and the other teams, obviously, Cleveland goes back to the and the Mets obviously haven't won since '86. Their last World Series appearance being 2015 or 2016 2015. against 2015 against the Royals, and then before that, 2000 against the Yankees. Who, right. And there's a very real possibility that we are in a New York state of mind for the World Series, as we could get another Subway Series. It's a very legitimate outcome for the, this, you know. Obviously, given that there's two of the teams left. Absolutely, all the Yankee fans I talk to, and and all the Mets fans I, I'm talking to are, are welcome. Like that would be great. Let's have a Subway series i have no problem with it i think they're you know they're they're rooting for it to happen i don't think any yankee fans are like let's play the dodgers i don't i think they let's, let's we're gonna go the, all the way here no, let's the have only, a subway series the only people that are really excited about a yankee dodger series are mlb executives because the idea of otani and the yankees in a world series I can't imagine how excited they would be for that. I would use more colorful Judge language. Judge versus Otani. But I don't think we need that to describe it. And and I guess, you know, the, the Mets are uh, – I'd be a little concerned uh, if I were the Mets going, okay, so Sho Shohei did absolutely nothing in the Padres series. I think he struck out ten times. He's a playoff choker. So, I mean, and this guy is just one of the more clutch players I've ever seen. So I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh, here well, it comes. I think the thing that you have to think with the Dodgers, and this is something that you will say for the Yankees with Judge and Soto and the – Cleveland Guardians with Ramirez. The Mets are really the only team that escape this sort of pitching strategy where you go, okay, what if I just don't throw Otani or Soto or Judge a strike? I'm just not going to throw them anything that's really a good hittable pitch anytime they come up. I don't care if I walk them a whole bunch because I'm going to say somebody else in that lineup has to beat me. And in the Guardian series, that was Lane Thomas. Mm -hmm. Austin Wells has got some big hits. For and the it was Yankees. Teoscar in the, uh, in, Teoscar. in the Padre series. But, but that that's what has to happen for those teams to be able to have a shot because otherwise you can just pitch around them and you go, okay, well, if, I, if, if Shohei Otani sees two pitches the entire series that he can actually do something with, puts an insane amount of pressure on him to do something with those two pitches. And that leads to him pressing, which might be why he's striking out a ton because he's up there saying, I got to do something. I got to do something. I think Aaron Judge is saying the same right. thing. And so they're <laughs> swinging at pitches that are maybe borderline just because they're trying to do something because they're not seeing anything they can hit. And that's the guy's behind them responsibility. And that's why the Freddie Freeman injury is such a big deal for the Dodgers because if he is not himself, if he really can't go, because, yeah, he was out there in game five against the Padres. He still got four, he still had a good batting average during the right, series, so he right. hits, hits the ball. But he doesn't. he's not hitting with the kind of power mm -hmm. that he was hitting. He can't run at all. He, he, I mean, he's clearly in pain. So 
him not being the force he was True. just, again, concentrates that pressure, whereas the Mets are kind of the one team that's left where it's just like their responsibility is a lot more spread out through the lineup. Yes, obviously Lindor is the engine that makes it go, but if Pete isn't hitting with power, you've got other guys in the lineup that can all step up and help pick up the slack. Obviously, in the Brewer series, Vientos played out of his mind. He had an amazing series. Right, right. And in the Philly series, too. And I think, you know, the Dodgers, here's where, where we kind of sell the Dodgers a little bit short. Their hitters are very experienced. So some of the stuff the Mets got, uh, pitching got uh, away with, if you want to say, in the Philly series with guys swinging at bad pitches and uh, they pitching might out not of the do that The quite Dodgers as much. are more disciplined, and they're going to make it harder. And the Dodgers mash left-handed pitching. I think they might have been the best team in majors hitting left-handed pitching, and the Mets have a lot of starting left-handed pitching. Yes, that's know, a in, big... In Quintana and Manaya. Right, and which, Peterson's going to follow Senga in game one. Which, but you're, you're hopeful because if you can get against the Yankees, that's a good matchup for you because they struggle a little bit if I, I believe against left-handed pitching well certainly more than the Dodgers do. Right. and 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 so yeah because the or Dodgers the Guardians. right the Dodgers go deep in that lineup and and so I think that it's going to be much more difficult for the Mets than you know because you think okay the Dodgers pitching I mean they're going to start Flaherty in game one he wasn't even on the team in, in until July well uh, he got traded I feel like he's your number one starter now because of all the injuries is my point to right. your, to your, well, yeah, to your but team that's also because Yamamoto pitched game five he'd be going game yeah. one Yamamoto's not going to pitch more than probably five innings, right? Well, Flaherty's not going to probably pitch more than five innings. Well, only because of effectiveness. I mean, if he's pitching lights out, I think they would like him to go longer. He's well, certainly stretched like out. Yamamoto go more than five I if he was. I don't know if they will because I don't know if he's stretched out yet to go that right. deep in a game. And no, no Kershaw, and obviously we can go through the litany of Dodger pitchers who won't be pitching in this series, and that would end the podcast. But they've got <laughs> a lot of good bullpen arms that they can use interchangeably. Really guys like Vessia, guys like Michael Kopech. They've got a lot of really good bullpen arms, but I do think that the Dodgers starting pitchers have an incredible burden to bear and that not any one of them can have a blow up game because since you have to get so many bullpen outs in your other games, having a, a Flaherty start where he only goes like two innings or yep. having a Yamamoto yep. blow up start really hurts in a long series could really hurt them because they only have so many bullpen arms they can turn to. And yes, it's great when you can use them one after another in succession. But what happens when you start having to ask them to get two innings and, and you can't sub them out? And a lot of you just said a lot of games, right? So those extra games, right? You can you can maybe mask it in a five game series even. But now these guys have pitched a ton, and these series take place over what nine days is how they're scheduled. Seven games possibly in nine days. Uh, you know, by the time the fifth day, how many times are you going to run Blake Training out there and and, and these right. guys? And if he's pitched a bunch of innings, uh, the Mets have the chance. Now it's all based on effectiveness. Let's face it. If you stink it up, you know you're in the right. same boat as the right. Dodgers. You're right. If any of the Met pitchers starting, and that that's the Mets' fear, is that, okay, you know, you've got amazing starting pitching so far this entire playoffs. Nobody's really had a particularly bad start so far. So what happens if somebody does? Yeah, yeah. Now, in a seven-game series, you can afford to lose a game to a bad start. <coughs> yeah. You can, and the Mets, the Mets, you know, lineup goes so deep. You know, I say so deep. It's a deep lineup in that it's, like you said, it's pretty it's much the an even keel. Remaining in the playoffs. That, that doesn't mean that that their top is as good as the no, Dodgers they don't or have the Yankees. A super, they're I not. Mean, Lindor is a superstar as much as. But those they're a pain in the neck all the way down to the bottom of the lineup. Right, and much more so than I think any of the other lineups. So that's obviously going to be what they kind of lean on and go. Okay, if we can have good at bats, we can wear down pitchers and get into bullpen. They're going to have to. They're going to have to do that, and they're going to have to score. That's how they win. Right, and that's how they win. And I think, you know, as a Met fan, what you have to hope is that Padres series seemed to mean so much to those Dodger players. Like, like in that the Padres – that 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 was the Padres World Series. At least they were acting. Yeah, right. but the Dodgers are too experienced and and too big a money team to go. We've done enough. They're trying to go They're all the way. They're going to try and go all the way. But there's a world in which, uh, given the season they've had, you lose Game One, maybe you get down in Game Two or Three, and all of a sudden you're just going. It's just not our year. The, the pitching is shaky. I just I just don't know if they can patch together the relief pitching to cover up for the right, lack right. of stars and, and, the and whole again, series. And, and the other thing we're not talking about is what happens if one of those bullpen guys has a blow-up inning? Because that's the one thing that whole strategy can't really handle. That's what the Mets did to the Phillies, by right. the way, is they, they, they beat up the bullpen, and, and, and that was, and they beat was up not some, expected. Right, and they beat up some good fill Now, I think the only people that might have expected it were Philly fans, because Philly fans are talking about how that team was 33-33 and 33 since the All-Star right. break, and right. that was not the team 
team that ran out to an amazing record in the first half. They, they, they struggled mightily down the stretch by their standards. And, and, and the other series, you know, the, the Yankees and the Guardians, you know, you, you would think, well, the Yankees have su- such an advantage because the Guardians don't hit particularly well. They've gotten a lot of clutch hitting from David Fry and Stephen Kwan in the playoffs that make you a little hopeful that they can be better than you might have expected. I think they match up they match up a little better than you might think against the Yankees, though. This okay. is a good this is a good deep Cleveland Guardian pitching staff that does not walk a lot of guys. But they also have the starting pitcher dilemma too. Right, but but they're much more prepared to pitch like that. They're built to pitch like that in a way, you know, from top to bottom with that bullpen in a way the Yankees are not. And so the Yankees they need great starts from their starters every single time out. You can't. And, and can you count on that from Clark Schmidt? Uh, you know, I, you really ask for Rodon. I mean, the Yankee fans are petrified of Rodon going right, out right. there. Luke petrified. We, right, and Luke Weaver has been amazing, but there is a part of you that's thinking, like, is this a Cinderella story, and is the carriage turning back to a pumpkin at a certain point? And you can't have that much confidence in Clay Holmes because uh, he lost his job as closer, and so even when you put him in there in the eighth inning, you know, they, they've got good pitchers back there, but the Guardians are better at that than the right. Yankees are. And the Yankee fans know that this team has a two- or three-game stretch of just not hitting the baseball and not scoring any runs in them they can totally do that because if all of a sudden the other guys in that lineup aren't producing you can just like we said you can just pitch around judge and soto and then you got a bunch of guys that are just swinging over balls at that point and and nesta cortez you know who i i would look like okay where is nesta cortez that's right he got injured late in the season has an elbow problem and he chances are will not pitch even if they get to the world series but certainly he won't be on right. the roster and for i'm sure this the series. yankees are thinking oh we really don't want to need to de- we don't need to depend on a marcus strobin start in this series Oh, that's right. I forgot he's still on the Yankees. Right, and they've avoided using him so far, and they're like they're probably really hoping he's not needed in a pivotal game four start or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's let's it's time. So let's let's make our picks. Um, who are you picking in the Yankees and the Guardians? Since we just came off of that, how I, many games? I think it's going to be the Yankees in six. Okay, I think the Yankees are the better overall team. I think they have enough pitching, and. They're, the Yankees have a deep enough lineup that they can manage the runs they'll need in a series against an offensive team like the Guardians. Unless somebody from the Guardians that not named Jose Ramirez or Naylor goes wild and has the series of his life, it's just hard for me to think the Guardians are going to score enough runs to win that series because they have to win four games. And that's why I picked the Yankees in five and not and, and not six. I, I think I think they're going to get on them, and, and, and it's going to be like, okay, the sum total of, of trying to carry this is going to just I, I'm, cause them I'm, to, I'm, to break. I'm giving the Guardians one straight-up win in the series because I think that they're good enough and that they'll just win one game just because they're better than the Yankees. And then I'm going to give them another because I think there's a game that the Yankees have in them where where the bats are just cold and they just don't score. Yeah. And that might look like could the, be same, the same game. It could look like the same game. It could, <laughs> it could be look the same like game. games that are the same, but I think that could happen. You know what I mean? And as good as guys like Tanner BBR and what I just, there's no Cleveland starting pitcher to think, well, yeah, I guess they could count him to go there's out there and be the one guy's going to go seven innings. There's or not six a Garrett innings. Cole. No. No, they don't have that. So, okay, and how about the Mets and the Dodgers? Your heart, your head, you want. I mean, this is a magic season is, for the Mets. So. Honestly, outside of the number of games, this is one that my heart and my head are pretty aligned on. I'm going Mets with both of them. This feels like a Mets win uh, for, for a variety of reasons, especially with the Tigers out of the postseason. They're the hot team. Mm-hmm. Left. Narratively, mm-hmm. they're the team that has the best narrative behind them right now. And so, obviously, that means absolutely nothing in terms of how the series will <laughs> that. play out. True that. But in terms of just how these things feel like they go, they're the hot team. They have the great story. Unless they just come out ice cold against the Dodgers, which I don't think they will because they're a feisty team. And they're going to keep plugging away even if they don't hit for a little while. I think that they're just going to find a way. And I think the Dodgers... They can kind of just look back if they lose the series and go, it was a pretty good year for How us. How do we get this far? Right. Right. Well, uh, I will say this. The Mets will be ahead 3-2 when they go back to Los Angeles. They'll lose game six, and they'll, have and they'll win game seven and they'll have to, to win. go to the World Series. And that would be a fun way. That's to... just what these Mets do. <laughs> and are you predicting a big series from Shohei? Um, I think Shohei will be better, but I don't think the Mets are going to pitch to him enough to have a huge series. I-, I think I'm with you on that. He'll hit a homer or two, but I think that might be the only pitches he sees. So the next uh, the next eight, nine days, guys, we'll do another podcast uh, You know, probably at the end of these or or, who knows maybe if the games are exciting enough we'll drop a surprise one midweek it's really exciting